Hi, Alan Stratton from Aswood Turns. Last week when I made this segmented utility bowl, I did it in response to a viewer question about the size and, and segment size of the bowl. And I decided to take a low-tech approach and manually do all the calculations just to make sure that there was no computer in the way. Well, a problem. We had a failure to communicate. What he was really after was just the overall dimensions. And it, he was an engineer and could easily calculate all the segments on it. Okay, I hope you appreciated the low-tech approach and low-tech review to how to calculate the segment sizes. And by the way, yes, there is an app for that. Now for the lid, I designed that at the same time but then when I got down to the end, I had used a piece of plywood for the central portion of it due to some problems I'd had with segments coming apart when they're in tight quarters such as this. And when it got down to that point, I did not like the way the plywood looked as a top. It works great as a bottom, but probably not so good for a top. So I decided to apply some lessons I'd learned recently from Molly Winton, and that is for wood burning or pyography. Now this is my first attempt, so I do intend to get better at it. And I, I hope she approves of it. It is a pattern with a basket weave, a homemade basket weave pattern, and I have burnished it with a little gold luster. So this is my first attempt at pyography. I'll be using it more in the future, and I do hope that you can appreciate my lidded bowl, even if you don't need to get the, take the manual approach. Let's make the lid. I'm starting by mounting my homemade plywood to a wood faceplate with double stick tape. Here I need a good, smooth, and most importantly, straight sides to the wood. Now I need to cut a mortise to receive the plywood in my first ring. But how do I center the ring? In this case, I mounted it to my squirrel chuck, then pressed a wood faceplate centered by the tailstock so that I can apply hot melt glue. Then flip the faceplate around to mount it on the spindle. Now to carefully cut the mortise. Since I've already cut the tenon portion, I cannot afford to overshoot the mortise size. Finally glue the plywood into the mortise. Unfortunately, this is the top side and I'm going to have to reverse the wood and glue it into another faceplate so I can build rings from the other direction. I probably should have rethought the whole sequence. Now to glue the remainder of the rings. I'm using a Longworth chuck adapted to use from my tailstock. This centers the ring better than I can other ways. I'll do some rough shaping on the outer edge of each ring to make things go easier later. I do love the long shavings that come from this oak, even now that it is dry. Finally, I'm ready to shape the lid starting with the exterior. This oak is hard but still tools nicely since it is all face grain due to the segmentation. With the exterior complete, I can tackle the interior starting with my gouge. There's no problem with vibration with this diameter since the walls are not that tall. After testing to the bowl's bottom section, I can form the edge to be a loose tenon. After the tenon is ready, I can fine tune the remainder of the lid. After a little more with the gouge, I switch to a round carbide scraper to follow the curve more easily.
Finally, part the lid off the faceplate and flip it over into my homemade coal jaws to finish off the upper surface. Here's where I decided the look of the plywood in the lid did not work for me. But I recently attended a workshop with Molly Winton on pyography. Since her workshop, I made my own power supply based on Graham Priddle's vaporizer, whose workshop I attended a year ago. I also made my own pyography pen and basket weave tip based on Molly Winton's course. If you want, I'll do separate videos making the vaporizer and the pen. I settled on a plan to alternate the basket weave tip inside loops defined by the segments. After outlining the edge with a sharp tip, I switched to my large basket weave tip. The vaporizer has more than enough power to drive this large tip. As I approached the center, I switched to a medium-sized plain tip to stipple the remaining wood. After burning the wood, I coated the burned area with black gesso and masked the raw wood. Now I'm rubbing on some rub and buff. Molly uses another competitive product but I've already had this on hand. I'm rubbing some on the higher spots left by the burning and leaving the black below. Finally, I need to make a simple handle for the lid. It is time for some skew work, at least for the convex surfaces. I'm using a bedan for some peeling action, then small gouge for the concave surface. My sharpened end wrenches make quick work sizing the tenon. However, they always cut a little large, so I'm touching it up with a skew until it measures correctly. After sanding, I cut a couple of V-groups on the top of the knob. I want to burn them to complement the wood burning. I'm using a piece of scrap countertop material to burn the groove. Finally, I'm making a small button to cover the tenon on the inside of the lid. My lid was too thin to have a shallow mount hole. After applying walnut oil and a good buff, it's finished. What a journey! It was my first opportunity to wood burn a wood turning. I plan to get a lot better at pyography with more practice. It's a good combination to use to create interest in an otherwise plain wood. I like my large utility bowl and hope you've learned as much as I have from this journey. With that, we'll see you again next week with another wood turning video. I love feedback via your comments. Please like this video. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe to both my website and YouTube channel. Always wear your full face shield. Goggles are simply not enough. Flying wood only giggles at goggles. Until next time, this is Alan Stratton from As Wood Turns.